So I understand that I'm speaking for about 15 minutes. If that's incorrect, please do interrupt me. So war is extremely bad for animals. This is despite the fact that soldiers no longer ride on horseback into battle. War is very bad for animals who are often the incidental victims of war. Though animals are not deliberately targeted by soldiers, by militaries, by bombs, often they are caught up in the fighting. Their habitats are destroyed and they are displaced, or they are maimed, or they are killed. This includes, of course, both wild animals and domesticated animals. So this was the kind of issue that initially got Sarah and I interested in animals and the ethics of war, and we published a paper in the journal Social Theory and Practice. But we then started thinking at a more foundational level about animals in the ethics of war, and we realised that there is a really curious gap in the literature, and that is a gap between animal ethics on the one hand, that is animal rights theory, for example, or the work of Peter Singer, or the work of feminist animal ethicists, work of by philosophers and people near philosophy who are exploring the normative significance of our relationship with animals and the value of animals. There's a gap between animal ethics and just war theory. And just war theory, which I'll introduce more fully in a second, is the dominant theory of the ethics of war in Western philosophy and Western thought. Though animals and war are both mainstream in contemporary ethics, very, very rarely are the two brought together. That is, rarely do animal ethicists consider just war theory, and rarely do just war theorists consider animal ethics. And this is despite the fact that philosophers might teach both topics on the same uh, course. And indeed, there are people who are big names in both fields, such as Jeff McMahon. Now, it's not quite the case that nobody's explored this, as we found as we started digging, and as we'll explore a little bit later, as I'll explore a little bit later in this presentation. However, sorry, I'm just checking the time. However, um, these explorations that do exist in the literature are extremely piecemeal. They will take a particular part of just war theory and apply it to a particular case of human-animal relationships. There's very, very little effort to create an inclusive account of just war theory, an account of just war theory that genuinely takes animals' value and animals' interests seriously. Now, before I get to that inclusive theory, let me introduce just war theory. As I've said, just war theory is the dominant approach to the ethics of war in the Western philosophical tradition. And it dates back to the early modern period and the pre-modern period with thinkers like Augustine. Now, just war theory encompasses at least two sets of considerations. The first of them are what are called jus ad bellum considerations. That is justice in going to war, roughly. And the idea is that War is sometimes appropriate. That is, this is not a radically pacifist theory that says that violence is always ruled out. Instead, it says sometimes it is appropriate for us to go to war, but we need to be clear about when, okay? There are right and wrong times to go to war. So what is the right time to go to war? Well, the right time to go to war are when a series of criteria are met. The first and most important of these is the criterion of just cause. That is, there has to be a good reason. What kinds of good reasons? Well, there are basically three, and the significance of mentioning these three will become clear shortly. First of all, the defense of self. Second, like the defense of one's own country. Second of all, the defense of an ally. Or third of all, humanitarian intervention to help a beleaguered population. The war must be engaged in for the right reason. That is, the uh, state that is going to war must have the right intention in going to war. It's not enough that there is a just cause. They can't use that as a mask for conquest, for example. The war must be declared by a legitimate authority, okay, such as the recognised democratically elected leader of a state. The war must have a reasonable chance of success. If there's no reasonable chance of success, then any harm or violence that is perpetrated as part of the war would be ultimately pointless. The war must be um, engaged in as a last resort. That is, nonviolent means must be attempted first. And the harm envisioned to, to be caused by the war must be proportionate to the harm that would be prevented by going to war. 
Now, what this means is that many, many wars are illegitimate, but at least in principle, and many of us believe in practice, certain wars are just. It is just to wage wars in certain cases. So that's your sad bell, and that's the first set of criteria, the first question that just war theory is concerned with. The second is your symbello, and that is justice in war, justice as part of combat. Here, we must ask whether violence is discriminate. That is, who is being targeted by gunfire? Who is being targeted by bombs being dropped? Are they military targets or are they civilians? Discriminate warfare targets only military targets. Indiscriminate warfare, which is unjust, targets civilians and civilian objects. The violence, again, must be proportional. Okay, The harm that is committed, and this includes side effect harm, which might include harm to civilians, although they cannot be targeted, they can be uh, harmed as a matter of side effect, according to just war theory. The harm that's committed must be proportionate to the value that a particular mission has to the war effort. And finally, the harm must be necessary. That is, less harmful methods of war must be favoured. If soldiers have a choice between killing or incapacitating an enemy, they should incapacitate the enemy. That doesn't mean it's always illegitimate to kill an enemy, far from it. But it means that when there are less violent options, they should be favoured. OK, so that's a very quick introduction to just war theory as traditionally understood. But we're proposing an inclusive just war theory. We're proposing a just war theory that includes animals and their interests and their value. We're not going to offer that inclusive just war theory in this presentation today, but instead we are going to offer some considerations of what it might look like and the kinds of questions it can answer. So an inclusive just war theory will tell us several things. It will tell us some things about going to war. For example, it will tell us whether we can wage war on animals' behalf. It can tell us whether we can wage war against animals. Now, these might sound like very bizarre possibilities, but both of them have been explored in the academic literature around warfare and animal ethics. But it's also going to tell us about animals in war. It will tell us about whether we can harm animals in the course of our fighting. That is, whether um, side effect harm against animals might be legitimate and how we can assess that. But it will also tell us about the use of animals for our war effort. And I should say it's this issue of side effect harm that was the subject of Mansara's first paper on this topic, although the paper that underlies this presentation covers a wide range of topics. But in order for it to tell us these things, we need to ask some key questions. For example, we need to ask whether um, we need to ask whether how just uh, sorry, we need to ask how an inclusive just war theory should include animals. OK, how can it count their values? How can it count their interests? It also needs to ask the more foundational question about whether just war theory is appropriate to protect animals at all. Do we need to modify or add to the criteria that we that are standard? But then if we're serious about considering animals and the ethics of war, we need to go further. And we need to recognise that just war theory can't do everything. So we need to ask whether there are resources beyond just war theory in the ethics of war to help animals, to protect animals, to include animals. OK, so to summarise what we're aiming to do in this project, first of all, we are aiming to bring together very disparate conversations, to take these questions that people are already asking about animals in warfare in very different contexts and not in communication with each other, to bring them together to show that there is a literature here, despite first impressions, if we're willing to look. And to use that as a foundation, a starting point, to create a genuinely inclusive approach to just war theory. And I've got a few minutes left, so I'll just introduce you to a couple of the, uh, the considerations that we've been looking at. One from the uh, Yusad Bellum, one from Yus in Bello. So I'll just do this very briefly and we can address them in further questions if necessary. So one area that Yusad Bellum is deployed is in the literature around so-called militarized conservation. The gentlemen you can see on the picture there are not soldiers, they're conservationists. They are conservationists who use military tactics and military approaches to protect biodiversity, to protect animals. In uh, Rosin Duffy's phrase, this has been called a war to save biodiversity. And 
this has been assessed using the language of just war theory, admittedly not so much by philosophers, but by people who are in conservation broadly understood, scholars in conservation broadly understood. So Amy Dickman and colleagues suggest that there may be a just cause for war in these cases. Specifically, a war on poachers might be justified by the instrumental value of the environment to human life and the intrinsic value of individual megafauna. That's a claim of just cause. Very explicitly, it's put in the language of just war theory. But what's fascinating is it's not clear how this interacts with our normal understanding of a just cause. The instrumental value of the environment doesn't clearly fit with defense of self, defense of ally or humanitarian intervention. Now, the intrinsic value of individual megafauna might, it might be a case of humanitarian intervention. If we have a genuinely inclusive just war theory, intervention to protect animals may be a just cause. However, framing it in this way is at odds with the way that Dickman and colleagues and other scholars in this area normally think about nature, that is of biodiversity or of the environment as a whole, rather than the value of individual animals. There's a fascinating tension there. We can also ask whether this is a last resort, whether it's proportional. Have nonviolent methods been attempted? Are we justified in killing individual humans to protect individual animals, given that, for example, humans and animals may have very different interests in continued life? That's a consideration that animal ethicists talk about a lot. And one possibility we explore beyond just war theory is the possibility of what's called jus ad vim. And that is a separate framework to just war theory, which says, what is the justice of deploying violence in cases short of war? Maybe just war theory is the wrong framework to use here. OK, thank you. I have a few extra minutes. I will, I will slow down slightly then and go into a little more detail on the next slide. So there we have a jus ad bellum consideration. Okay, now there's other jus ad bellum considerations we could talk about, but as I say, I'm just dipping into this literature we've been exploring, hopefully trying to suggest why these questions are interesting to us and what just war theory can help to tell us about the use of animals in war or the place of animals in war. So next we turn to a really fascinating question, which is the use of animal soldiers. And this is a use, ad, a use in bellow consideration. OK, this is a question about the use of violence in war, the way that um, individuals can behave in war on the battlefield. Now, this is a question that, as far as we can tell, although it's been addressed by some scholars in animal studies and critical animal studies, it's not. And, and indeed, I should stress in international humanitarian law, it's not something that's been explored in any great detail by just war theorists or animal ethicists using um you know, the approaches that we're inclined to, to be drawn towards, just war theory, animal rights, and so forth. Nonetheless, we think that there are a range of literatures in contemporary animal ethics and just war theory that could be very, very valuable in exploring these questions. And there were two sets of questions that we're particularly interested in when it comes to animal soldiers. And I should clarify, animals are used on the battlefield in all kinds of ways, as transport, as mascots, as guards, as sniffers, sniffer, you know, sniffing animals, search and rescue, and so forth. Some or all of these could be framed as animal soldiers. Some or all of them are present on literal battlefields. So the question becomes, the questions become this. Is it legitimate for militaries to use animals in their uh, waging of war? And when soldiers encounter animals on the battlefield, how should they interact with them? Is it permissible to target the um, enemy animals who are on the battlefield. That is, would it be discriminate to shoot at an enemy dog or not? Now, we believe that there are at least four sets of literatures, four sets of theoretical frameworks that could be really, really valuable in addressing this question. Though, as we say, um, these are starting points for trying to work out where these animals might fit in in an inclusive just war theory, rather than something that we propose can offer all of the answers right here, right now. So the first of them is an explicitly pacifist or abolitionist approach. OK, uh, we, we, we're using a slightly old version of the slides here. I apologise. So the, there's some missing uh, words there. So 
Abolitionism is an approach to animal rights theory that says that the use of animals is impermissible. Many of you may have come across the work of people like Gary Francione, who is a well-known abolitionist theorist. Pacifism, of course, is a tradition of ethics, tradition of activism, which says that violence is illegitimate. Now, the abolitionist or pacifist line will say, well, you cannot use these animals. And that means that it's very, very clear on one set of questions, the question of whether soldiers and militaries can use animals, but it's much less clear on questions of how to action, how soldiers should actually behave when they encounter these animals on the contemporary battlefield. Okay, the second possibility is the just war theory literature, the existing just war theory literature on what are known as innocent threats. An innocent threat is an individual or entity that poses a threat to a soldier, yet who is nonetheless themselves innocent. Paradigm example of this would be a child soldier. Child soldiers, of course, are used in many contemporary conflicts around the world. A child with a gun is not a guilty party, a young child with a gun. However, a young child with a gun could pose a deadly threat to a soldier or to civilians indeed. And this existing literature could be drawn upon to identify the ways in which animal soldiers are analogous to or not analogous to other innocent threats, such as child soldiers. So this is very useful when it comes to the question of targeting these soldiers in the battlefield, but it's not very useful when it comes to the question of whether militaries may legitimately use these animals. Okay, a third set of uh, literatures draws upon the international humanitarian law literature, which, as I said, is actually quite well developed in this area as of about five years ago when uh, these questions started to be asked. And this provides a really useful starting point for considering animals in the ethics of war and an inclusive just war theory. Okay, One of the limits from the perspective of um, philosophers with international humanitarian law literature is that, for example, um, existing international humanitarian law literature is often quite wedded, understandably, to existing legal frameworks, to existing legal apparatus, to existing black letter law, for example. Philosophers, just war theorists, might be much more willing to tear these up and to start again when they are developing their theoretical frameworks. So that's perhaps one of the reasons that there is room for both international humanitarian law and just war theory. And let me be quite clear that international humanitarian law is often very much welcome just war theory. Uh, and indeed, in the specific animal case, there are a number of international humanitarian lawyers who have called for more philosophical exploration of these questions. OK, and finally, there is a set of literatures from animal ethics, which draws upon what is called the social, thank you, the social membership approach to animal rights. And what this does is it says, what groups do non-human animals belong to? For example, are these animals workers? If so, maybe they're entitled to workers' rights. And so they're entitled to pay and pension. That means we can't kill them when they're no longer useful, which is a real world practice in the military. Are these animals citizens, as Donaldson and Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker have argued? If so, maybe they can be used by militaries insofar as all citizens can be called upon to protect their country. OK, so there's two examples, one just in bello, one just at bellum, uh, of the kinds of questions that we're interested in, the kinds of questions that are being addressed or not being addressed in the literature. So what now? Well. It's time to bring together these very disparate questions and to use them as a foundation to develop a genuinely systematic and genuinely inclusive just war theory. We believe that war may be hell, and we're quoting here Michael Waltzer, but even in hell, things can be better or worse. And we would add, things can be better or worse for animals. And that's what an inclusive just war theory is trying to do. We believe that developing this inclusive just war theory, given the influence of just war theory in the real world, could be a chance to make the world, and warfare specifically, a little bit less awful for animals and for humans. But there's lots of work to do here, and we welcome fellow travellers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my pronouns are she, they. I work in the field of women's gender studies at the intersection of critical race theory, post-colonial studies, transnational sexuality studies, and critical animal studies. And it's from these frameworks that this talk emerges. Again, my talk today is entitled The Racialized Dual Politics of Military Working Dogs in the U.S. War on Terror. This is part of my book project in, in process. 
So I have an article published about this that I'll also share in the chat at the end if you'd like to read um, in more depth and further. And I really invite you to think with me and um, questions I look forward to. So Cairo, a US military working dog, was part of the SEAL Team 6 mission that captured and killed Osama bin Laden on May 1st, 2011. Similarly, Conan, another military working dog, was part of the U.S. military's high-profile killing of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in Syria in 2019. Both killings promised a resolution to the terror, fear, and anxiety engendered by the figuration of the elusive terrorist in the, quote, U.S. war on terror. Special attention was given to the role of military working dogs in both of these killings. Dogs deployed within this war, like Conan and Cairo, are folded symbolically and materially into a species-infused racialized nationalism, deployed as tools of intimidation, equipment to be cared for, pets to be loved, and heroes to be honored. So this talk today considers how, in their role within U.S. militarism, U.S. military working dogs are both subjected to military and nationalist violence, and instrumentalized to support this violence in the service of U.S. imperialism. Through this analysis, this talk asks what an intersectional anti-militarist and multi-species politics looks like that could combat these politics of disposability for human and non-human animals. The U.S. military has what has been called the largest canine contingent in the world. In their role within U.S. militarism, the dogs, as I said, are subjected to military and nationalist violence. Tracing the deployment of dogs in US militarism, I think, reveals the complex workings of a racialized biopolitics and war. Here I'm drawing on Foucault's notion of biopower in a sense, the right to make live or let die. Nicole Shukin argues that biopower hinges on the productions of species difference as strategically ambivalent rather than absolute, allowing for the contradictory power to both dissolve and reinscribe borders between humans and animals. Shukin argues that biopolitics often instrumentalizes what she calls zoopolitics, an account of power that describes how animal life is variously protected or framed as expendable. The racialized biopolitics of the war on terror that marks the US enemy others as expendable and disposable have been widely examined. The effects of the zoopolitics of this war as they are attached to dogs are part of the lesser examined dynamic of a racialized US biopolitics which this talk today considers. So during a White House press conference um, on October 27, 2019, former President Donald Trump announced that the US military killing of, um, announced the US military's killing of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Notably, his report focused on the involvement of the dog in the mission, to which he referred to as beautiful, talented, the ultimate fighter, the ultimate everything. After his speech, Trump retweeted tweeted, excuse me, a Photoshop picture of him placing a medal around the dog's neck with a caption, quote, we have declassified a picture of the wonderful dog named not declassified that did such a great job in capturing and killing the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This announcement became one of the most retweeted posts of his presidency. Mainstream US media sources, including the New York Times, Politico, Newsweek, and others also fixated on the role of the dog in the military mission. The dog's face often used as an image attached to the news of al-Baghdadi's death. The dog is an affectively or emotionally potent symbol in this terrorist killing. The focus on the dog provides a mediated frame through which to consume stories about US state-sponsored killing. The dogs are framed as loyal, courageous, heroic, willing to sacrifice their lives for the U.S. and its military endeavors, ideal soldiers and icons for American nationalism. Belgian Malinois and German Shepherds are common breeds for military working dogs in the United States and more broadly. Favored for their strength, these dogs embody the ideal of the impenetrable, ferocious, and heroic American war dog. Figurations of these dogs build on historical legacies of nation connected to projects of state securitization, nationalism, and racism. German shepherds were prominent in Nazi Germany, used in combat and to guard concentration camps. The dogs were folded into frameworks of US nationalism post-World War I, 
as the United States started to grow its own war dog program. The use of the dogs in the US military also connects to their use by police often in the service of anti-Black racism. As you see here, pictured from images where dogs were deployed against Black protesters in Birmingham, Alabama, and more recently in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. We also see this at Standing Rock as well as many other moments. In World War I, dogs were used as messengers in search and rescue missions and to guard bases as military mascots. In World War II, the U.S. Army asked American families to donate their dogs to support the war effort with a promise that it would return these dogs when the war was over. In Vietnam, the Army no longer relied on American families' dogs. The dogs were always intended to be war dogs. The U.S. brought approximately 5,000 dogs to Vietnam to fight and left them all when they returned to the U.S. The dogs then were really the first class produced from the beginning as animals whose function was to serve the US Army and who were brought into life in essence to die for the US. The shift in frames to which the dogs' lives were apprehended from animals whose lives needed to be protected as domestic pets to animals whose lives are expendable as tools of war is reflected in the US Army's classification of dogs in Vietnam and since then as expendable equipment. Such a classification instilled, installs a mandatory euthanasia policy for the US Army, which required it to kill dogs after they were no longer useful to it, or to leave these dogs in forest countries after American troops returned. In November 2000, HR 5314 was passed, mandating that military working dogs should be adopted and not killed after service if deemed able. Former military working dog handlers, animal advocates, and politicians worked together to try to further protect the dogs and law, particularly in shifting the categorization of the dogs from disposable equipment so that better care facilitated adoption and transportation could be offered for the dogs. U.S. Senator, um, Richard Blumenthal introduced H.R. 4103, or the Canine Members of the Armed Forces Act, to the U.S. House in 2012. One of the driving organizing principles behind the bill was the demand to shift the official military classification of dogs from equipment used by the armed forces to members of the armed forces. The act failed to pass in either chamber of Congress. However, provisions allowing for the transfer of retired military working dogs and the creation of a system of veterinary care for these dogs were included as amendments to the National Defense Authorization Act for 2013. The provision, however, reclassifying these dogs as canine members of the military failed to pass in Congress. So while the demand of the canine members of the Armed Forces Act are important for treating military working dogs more humanely, they really do not solve the violence of using dogs as weapons and soldiers for war. Mobilizing dogs as part of the military, training them to kill and be killed, can never be an ethical practice committed to animal well being. Multiple reports suggest, for example, that the US military left many of its contracted dogs in Afghanistan, particularly Kabul, during its withdrawal in August 2021 as it did with so many Afghan collaborator, collaborators, though the military claims it brought back all its working dogs. The instrumentalization of these dogs in US militarism does not function in isolation from the sacrificial and affective or emotional economies of war that deem multiple lives as expendable, including those racialized others in the Middle East marked as collateral damage, who are dehumanized, animalized, and treated as disposable. Military working dogs then are deployed as material, symbolic, and affective or emotional weapons to stand in for, embody, and enact the violence of US white military masculinity. The dog, as signifier and metaphor, is also deployed to dehumanize the terrorist other, and by extension, all Middle Easterners. Trump, for example, enthusiastically described the capture and killing of al-Baghdadi during a press conference, calling him, quote, sick, depraved, and vicious. Trump's description drew heavily on animalizing imagery around dogs, and the same speech during which Trump lauded the role of the military working dog in the al-Baghdadi killing. Trump reported, quote, he, al-Baghdadi, reached the end of the tunnel as our dogs chased him down. 
and then later said of the ISIS leader, quote, he was a gutless animal who died like a dog, end quote. So literal dogs and figurations of humans as dogs haunted both the orchestration of torture at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and the images that circulated globally of this torture. In one of the infamous images from Abu Ghraib, US female soldier Lindy England is depicted standing over a naked Iraqi man holding a leash attached to a collar around the man's neck. In another widely circulated image, Army Sergeant Michael J. Smith holds a growling dog feet away from a prisoner's face. This practice is routine for Smith, who is known to let his unmuzzled black Belgian shepherd Marco bark and lunge at several prisoners for his own amusement. Smith and his colleague also used their dogs to make detainees do what they called the quote, doggy dance, a movement a detainee would make when both soldiers approached the person from different sides with their dogs, so the person would have to dance between the two. The dogs are instrumentalized then as tools of torture in both symbolic and material terms. So what does this mean for multi-species futures? Reframing the national politics of war is not a zero sum game. Valuing animal life does not necess necessitate devaluing human life. Honoring human life currently devalued by US military nationalism does not require diminishing the recognition of dogs lives. The ideologies of speciesism and racism are intimately linked and co-constitutive. One cannot be overcome without also the other being challenged. The analysis in this talk hopes to suggest then that to challenge human exceptionalism and racism in the sacrificial economies of war, we should orient our practices towards an analytic of what Claire Jean Kim calls a politics of avowal, an intersectional approach to power that challenges a politics of disposability for all of those rendered in the position of animal within US bio and zoo power. Approaching dogs used by the US military in this way would be to work against accepting any bodies as legitimately killable, human and non-human animal. This framework I'm offering today is just a snippet of a much larger book project in which I also think about um, rescuing dogs from Iraq and Afghanistan by US soldiers. Um, and part of what I'm also interested in thinking about, sorry for the grainy image here, is the move to use now what are called robot dogs within US policing and military practices. To be clear, I don't see this as an ethical response to war. While it might relieve some pressure from some dogs, of course, the larger question we have to be committed to thinking about animal ethics is a broader framework um, of ethics that both challenges imperialism, militarism, and state racism. So I welcome questions during our Q&A session. You are also welcome to reach out to me via my email and I'll post a link to a paper from which this talk is partly based on. And this is my dog Rumples. And I offer this as just a snippet into my own um, deep investment in the question of dogs and ethics and liberation. So thank you all so much for thinking with me and I look forward again to our Q&A together. Thank you so much um, to the organizers of the symposium and for you all for attending today. I want to begin um, by offering a quote, which I offer, uh, invite you to read. Histori uh, heroic stories of Ukrainians rescuing animals, evacuating their own animals against all odds in photos like the one seen here have helped to humanize Ukrainian people during this war. In contrast to images like this, Stories of Russian barbarism towards both humans and animals have reinforced antipathy towards Russia. That's not to say that empathy for Ukraine and antipathy for Russia wouldn't have happened anyway, but animal stories can tug at heartstrings in a particular way, as we know. And in a modern war, um, we are exposed to these stories constantly via social media, which is what George Packer says so eloquently in this piece. We see images like these not only with civilians, but also with uniformed soldiers, including official military social media channels, sharing photos and stories of soldiers who are defending not only human life, but non-human life in Ukraine. 
Today, I'll start by introducing a few key case studies reflective of themes in animal wartime storytelling, and I should say that are particular to the extremely nuanced geopolitics and tensions longstanding between Ukraine and Russia. I have the following central question in mind. How are stories and representations of animals affecting perceptions of this war and of Russia and Ukraine, respectively, more broadly? Next, I'll briefly discuss uh, social media, which is, of course, key in sharing and resharing and digesting these stories. Of course, accessibility to social media is a tool for good in many cases. It can quickly mobilize people into action. It can host and facilitate fundraising and engage people from all over the world concurrently, but there are also challenges and risks. Finally, I consider engagement with animal causes and stories in Ukraine over time on social media as one indicator of fatigue. Do these stories have the same affective influence in the digital space as they did a few months ago? The first study is the story of Adik, the white pit bull pictured here who was stolen from a Ukrainian prisoner of war and given as a trophy to a Russian soldier. Adik is not a military working dog, he was providing companionship and emotional support. In the image in the upper right corner, we see Adik with his captor in a still image from a video that was distributed by Russian propagandists. They disseminated the video for purposes of demoralizing and humiliating Adik's real family as they rejoiced in this quote unquote prize. The Russian soldier also changed Adik's name, now calling him Vorts, which is the Russian word for wolf. Adik, when spelled in Ukrainian, contains a letter that doesn't exist in the Russian alphabet, a reminder that Ukraine is a sovereign nation with its own language, its own alphabet. The Russification of Ukraine and the history of the Ukrainian language being purposefully stigmatized and systematically suppressed can be dated as far back as the 17th century. This isn't new. So changing Adik's name to a Russian name is another example of this, and it's meant to send a message. This is not so much a single case study, but unfortunately a phenomenon that has been repeated throughout the last months of full-scale war since February, and that's the intentional destruction and targeting of animal shelters, civilian stables, and pets. This is something the Ukrainian government has made official accusations against Russian military forces for, um, for specifically targeting these places. Um, Russian troops have been accused, for example, of killing 30 horses, when they torched a stable, burning them alive. There have also been accounts of Russian soldiers slaughtering pets as they withdrew from towns and cities, conspicuously piling bodies, and finally of entering shelters and of shooting kenneled dogs. Sadly, non-human animals have long been casualties of war. And of course, Dr. Diamond Leno just detailed this and articulated this for us. Um, long been casualties of war in a number of ways. Um, and we know this, but we don't always know the numbers, especially with non-military dogs who are counted as soldiers. Um, but of civilian animals, non-human deaths are rarely, if ever, counted in official death tolls. But historically, animals have been targets in war to deprive enemies of food, of income, or of transport in the case of horses. But killing kennel dogs and killing pets in Ukraine uh, seems like a different twisted form of military strategy. In addition to inflicting countless other scars of war, here they're killing animals to inflict emotional pain. Now, in a symposium focused on animals and war and disasters, of course, the stories are more dark than they are light, but I did make a conscious effort to include more positive stories, and I will shift to those now. Um, first, I'll introduce Levchuk. He is the cat mayor of the city of Lviv in western Ukraine. He was rescued from a tree outside of City Hall in 2020, um, and he now resides there, and he rose to fame mostly on TikTok. Uh, you can see him in the photo on the top right um, in an official meeting with Lithuanian delegates getting a cheeky scratch. Um, and I absolutely love this photo. It's very simple, but it speaks candidly to the power of the human-animal bond even during, or perhaps especially during times of intense duress. And of course, Levchuk's social media presence has shifted. It's more serious, more urgent, more informational, but there's still such a lightness to it. And that's because of the nature of who he is. He's a cat mare, that's funny. But it's also resistance. Um, petting cats in tense meetings, finding moments of joy with animals, and the near human or the near universal experience of laughing at cat videos on the internet, that's resistance because it's self-care. 
Next, I'll talk about Patron. He's the bomb sniffing dog who is pictured on the left with the cat mirror himself. They had an official meeting. Um, he's a Jack Russell Terrier, as you can see. He was bred as a show dog, but he showed um, a great ability in sniffing explosives. He has become a national hero after helping detect hundreds of landmines and unexploded bombs. And thus, he's become a powerful symbol of Ukrainian resistance. He's pictured on billboards. He's in official war broadcasts. Um, and he even has a medal for bravery from President Zelensky. And just yesterday, I just added this image of the stamps. Uh, just yesterday, a friend in Ukraine posted that he'd bought this collectible set of official stamps, which you can see features Patron. Um, there were huge, huge queues at the main post office in Kiev to purchase these, and they are charity stamps. They're going toward purchasing a demining vehicle and also donating proceeds to animal shelters. Uh, next, this little black kitten um, named Snake was rescued in July. Special forces, Ukrainian special forces, were taking a photo of Snake Island with a drone. That's where Snake got his name. Um, and somehow they saw in this footage this tiny kitten. The commander included the task of bringing him back safely as a mission objective, which they completed. Um, they said, in fact, Snake found them when they landed. Um, he's now been adopted by a family in Kyiv. And the story of Snake directly juxtaposes the stories of Russian bombings and shootings and shelters and stables. In those cases, Russian soldiers use military resources, not for any real tactical discernible military advantage, but to inflict emotional damage through the killing of animals. With Snake, Ukrainian soldiers use military resources also for a non-tactical advantage, but for a simple mission of saving a tiny life and of spreading joy through the story of an unlikely rescue. And my last case study uh, is the story of Max. Um, I included a couple of the more interesting headlines I found in English language media reporting this story, um, which I first saw on Facebook. I've been seeing it circulating even months later, um, and probably of these stories was the most widely reported overall, or maybe just um, in English uh, reporting of the story. Um, but I'm very interested in the story of Max because it ensigns a sense of intentionality and imbues Max with a sense of agency, uh, which relates to the notion of animals being superior judges of character. So there's kind of these layers here, um, if you read into it a bit. Um, consider the jokes and memes that are something like, if my dog doesn't trust you, then I don't trust you. Or if my cat doesn't like you, she knows something I don't. Now, these are silly, they're funny, but this is a really fascinating and complex topic that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but I do think that the story of Max, as it's told here, exemplifies it. Um, in the first headline, we have the word deserts. Dog deserts Russian special forces to fight for Ukraine. The word deserts is very intentional. It suggests Max made a conscious decision, maybe based in some sort of ideological epiphany or something like this, to leave Russian forces. The second headline includes that Max was abandoned, um, but it still says he swapped sides. The full story as I understand it is that Max was left for dead in a forest when Russian soldiers retreated and he was found near death um, by Ukrainian soldiers who nursed him back to health and began retraining him in Ukrainian. As you can see in the more recent images from about three months ago, he, he looks very healthy. Um, and now an important note to mention, and again, this was expressed, articulated very well in the preceding presentation. Um, so I will just want to mention this briefly. It's really important to mention that the language that's used here, and I talked about this imbuement of agency and of choice, but this is an illusion of choice that's made through headlines like these. And I've talked about Patron and I've talked about Max and I've talked about military dogs, but again, this isn't a choice they made. They didn't make the choice to risk their lives. Um, they didn't start these wars. They didn't enroll in the military. They don't subscribe to a particular ideology or patriotism, right? Um, so I don't want to talk about military working dogs and use that language and take that title for granted. It's incredibly important to acknowledge the lack of choice um, that these dogs have. And when headlines like these are published, they obfuscate that reality. Um, but to wrap up the case story of study of Max, um, the message is that dogs like him, as superior judges of moral character, would not choose to fight for Russia. So I think that's in particular a very interesting um, theme that's being evoked through animals here. Um, I'll transition here to talk about social media as a potential microcosm uh, for gauging fatigue related to this ongoing war. 
Um, fatigue, of course, is a natural, normal, healthy response to being constantly exposed to violence and suffering. Um, this fatigue can be quantified by decreases in engagement um, with stories and also with donations. For example, Charmaine Brett, who's quoted here, stated back in July that donations to her, organ her organization, Veterinarians Without Borders, uh, were 20% of what they were when full-scale war began. Um, with this in mind, I expected that engagement with animal stories and with animal welfare concerns as measured through social media spiked in March and April and would have dropped off thereafter. Um, and here we can see a visualization of this. So this is overall engagement um, by all interactions, doesn't count views. I don't have access to that because I'm not an administrator of this public group, but this is um, all interactions by type of post since the full-scale war began. Um, so you can see these spikes in interest um, and interaction back in March, a little less so in April. And then there's been kind of a gradual dropping off and leveling since uh, around June. Um, and I should say, too, I, I can talk, if it's interesting, I could talk more about my specific methodologies for this presentation. Um, but I ended up focusing only on one group for purposes of this talk today, um, because this Facebook group is really the de facto um, hub for networking on animal issues in Ukraine um, by social media. Now, you'll see the asterisk I have following the page title. Um, and that brings me to another interesting point. So that's why I was first, when I began uh, gathering data here, I was running multi-group reports and comparison reports of engagement and I was getting weird output. And I quickly realized this is why there are two identically named groups um, that also look identical. And if you look at the uh, landing pages, they have the same image, but one was created uh, a month later. And you can also see a banner that says it's created by um, Chuck Norris memes and jokes page. Um, I, of course, this threw up red flags. Unfortunately, we have this banner that's telling us this so that we could look into it a bit more. Um, I also found very little of any recent meaningful engagement. There are very few interactions. It seems to be mostly uh, people with good intentions reposting widely, you know, original posts that need more attention in Ukraine um, focused groups. Um, but there's very little, if any, engagement here. So I wondered then, like, what is the purpose of making this group? There's no purposeful scamming or questionable fundraising going on here. Um, my guess is that the Chuck Norris page uh, noted massive organic growth of this original group um, and saw an opportunity to create a duplicate group to harvest followers at some point later on. They could change the group name to something unrelated, having or, uh, kind of harvested these followers, maybe thousands of them. Um, in addition to capitalizing on the war in ways like these, which again, that's just a guess, um, there is also misinformation and disinformation. For example, the image on the left went viral in 2000, uh, went viral in March uh, with hashtags like the one you can see here, but it's from Turkey in 2018 from a house fire. Uh, there's also the story in the upper right, uh, where USA Today investigated and found no evidence to suggest the Ukrainian army was using cats to identify sniper lasers. Uh, this is a story that went viral on social media, starting on Twitter. Uh, it first appeared in a tweet on February 27th, so this is very early, this is day three of the full-scale invasion. Um, gathered uh, more than 8,000 interactions in one day, um, in less than a day actually, because uh, near the end of the day, the original poster admitted the story was entirely fake. They wrote that the tweet was meant to, quote, confuse and trigger people, end quote, um, and also said that something to the effect of people are too stupid to engage critically and to look into this further to see that it may not be true. Finally, the most urgent concern is blatant identity theft to get donations. The screenshot on the bottom right is one of countless examples I could have selected um, showing specific language that an alleged scammer was using. I also included an example of another Facebook post where a couple was alleged to have multiple crowdfunding accounts and they were actually stealing local stories of actual rescuers on the ground uh, to gain donations. And some of these scams have raised tens of thousands of dollars. Um, for sake of time, I, I'll let us glance at these. You can see the trajectories are mostly similar. Um, these are different uh, gauges of looking at interactions, some as averages, some as raw numbers. Um, this is new member growth. So again, we see peaks 
a much lesser peak in April. So that suggests that new interest um, in animal welfare causes, again, using Facebook and using just one group as a microcosm of this, um, just as suggestive of future research. Um, but we'll see that fewer new members were coming to this group in April, and it's really leveled off since then. Um, and then shares are less than half of what they were at levels of peak engagement. Uh, but I'll move to conclude today uh, to say that stories only have life and power through being told and shared and retold. Engaging critically with stories can illuminate ways that animals become vectors for narrating themes of this war. The story of Adik being stolen and his name changed is emblematic of centuries worth of efforts to Russify Ukraine. Russian forces targeting civilian animals and animal shelters is a twisted exploitation of the human animal bond as if a response to these stories of Ukrainians evacuating and rescuing animals against all odds. But a cat mare, a kitten named Snake, and a military dog, Matt, quote, changing allegiance, each tell stories of Ukrainian resistance in diverse ways. I conclude today thanking you all for listening. I also want to make a final note about language and the importance of the language we use to talk about the war. The photo on the left is not from this year, it's from 2015, from the Eastern Donbas region, where we see a cat stepping carefully over rubble. The Russo-Ukrainian War did not begin in 2022, it began in 2014. So when we think about fatigue, we need to keep in mind that human animal suffering in Ukraine due to Russian aggression is not new. In, uh, when I first began doing research into animal welfare as a social movement in Ukraine, which was before the full-scale war began, something said something to me that really stood out. They said, quote, animal welfare did not exist in Ukraine before 2014, end quote. The Euromaidan revolution in 2013 and 14 really marked a new era of visible social activism in Ukraine, one that included animal activism, but it also marked the start of war and occupation. I also wanted to leave you with the handles for You Animals, an organization created in 2016. They are helping dogs, cats, and other pets, uh, but they're also helping wildlife, animals, and farms, and they've even sourced and paid for vegan meals for vegan members of the Ukrainian armed forces to be able to eat on the front lines. Um, they're on the ground in Ukraine distributing funds where they are most needed, so they're con collecting funds and then doing vetting on the ground, um, giving funds as needed to large animal shelters, established rescues, micro shelters, and even to individuals who are housing dogs and homeless cats in their homes. Um, so they're really doing betting on the ground and doing great work and really transparent reporting. So to anyone who feels called, I did want to give uh, mention to them. And um, finally, I, I, I had to include somewhere a tiny tribute to Milka, who is my favorite internet cat. Uh, she evacuated her home in Ukraine with her owners early on, but sadly the stress of constant moving um, and of hearing explosions was too much for her heart and she passed away. Um, so I wanted to dedicate this presentation to Milka, but also to the animals whose names we may never know, but who we won't forget. Thank you for your attention.